Yes, welcome back. So before the break, we were looking at people who are not enthusiastic about what God has done. He loved the world so much that he sent his son not to condemn it and destroy it, but to save it by becoming a curse for the people. But the people are not into about it. Why? It is because they love the darkness so much, they are not willing to give it up. And so they hide in the, um, uh, in the darkness rather than coming into the light of uh, God's, into the light of Jesus' presence. All right, so um, today we Christians have our own version of this. Uh, people avoid going into God's presence. They avoid, in fact, sometimes even going to church. Because when they go into God's presence, they feel convicted of their sinfulness. God begins to expose the dirt which is there inside. Because where he is, there is light. And once you go into the presence of his light, the darkness begins to get exposed. I mean, the deeds of darkness begin to get exposed. So some believers even go to the extent of avoiding spending any time with God so that they can continue living in the darkness. As long as you're in the darkness, everything feels all right, you know, because you cannot see the dirt. So you can tell yourself, oh, I'm doing all right. Compared to the people of the world, I'm doing fine. But if a person spends time in God's presence every day, having a meaningful time of devotions, during that meaningful time of devotions, God will speak to you. He will convict me of the things uh, where, uh, you know, where I have um, erred. He, he, he will convict me of those areas where I have not uh, reached up to his mark, up to his standard. So we can be like these people over here, uh, even though we are believers, we can be like these people who love the darkness and choose to continue hiding in it. Or we can be people who love God and therefore choose to come into his presence every day, even though it's going to take a little bit of time and sacrifice. And even though it will mean that God will have a frank talk with us and point out things to us about ourselves, which we may not like. So um, the Lord will do this for us if we go into his presence. So if we love the truth, it says in verse 21, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So if we really love the truth, if we really want to live according to God's standards, then we will be willing to come into his light every day and allow him to expose whatever there is so that he can correct us and rectify us in those, in those areas. And then everyone will be able to plainly see that what we are doing, we are doing it in the sight of God, keeping him in mind, and we will do things which will honor and please him. Uh, so these are the things which Jesus wanted to convey to Nicodemus. So in a way, Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, don't be like those other Pharisees who love the darkness and who are hiding over there. Instead, be different. I am the son of man. This is your first chance. I've come now to save, not to destroy. The second time I come, there's going to be only destruction. So here is your chance. Grab it. And we go on to see later that Nicodemus does grab this chance. He's not like the other Pharisees, you know, who reject Jesus. Because they loved the darkness so much, they didn't want to accept the Lord. But Nicodemus was not like that. He makes the right choice. And therefore, he is going to see the, I mean, in fact, uh, yeah, he is in heaven. And when the kingdom of God is established, he will be part of it. You know? So when the future kingdom is established, he will be a part of it. Um, so um, now we come to another event. Uh, that would be in verses 22. OK, maybe we can just uh, read. Uh, or maybe we can read the entire thing. OK, if, if you could read from 22 all the way up to 30, we will look at, us, look at it as one single chunk. Yeah, 22 to 30. After these days, these things Jesus said, his disciples 
came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near uh, Salem because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into Paris. Then there uh, arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about uh, purification, and they came came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom. Voice, therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase what I must dis, uh, decrease. Yes. All right. So here, uh, it, uh, this, this uh, narrative starts off with an argument which takes place uh, between John's disciples and a certain Jew doesn't give the name of the person. In verse 25, we get to know that a certain Jew gets into an argument with John the Baptist's disciples um, over the matter of ceremonial washing. One thing which Jesus began to teach when he came is that it's not enough to be outwardly clean. You need to get clean on the inside because only then you will be able to enter the kingdom of God. Um, up to now, all the teachers of the law had been focusing on outward cleanliness. Um, so if a person attends a funeral, uh, then they become unclean because you're not supposed to touch a dead body. Uh, so um, anyone who has touched the dead body is declared as unclean and then he has to undergo a few a, a set of rituals to get ceremonial cleansing okay so these are all customs in the uh, old testament and the jewish people were supposed to follow these customs and every single one of these customs mentioned in leviticus deuteronomy numbers they all had a spiritual significance you know most of us are unaware of that so we think that Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy are very vague. The rules given in them are so vague. You wonder why, what does God have against prawns? Why did he tell people that they should know of the Old Testament uh, Israel, that they should not eat prawns, that they should not eat pork? Uh, so it's, it's all a big puzzle for uh, people today. But back then, every single law that was given had a spiritual significance. Now, we are not doing a study on the book of Leviticus, so we cannot get into the details of that. But just to use one simple example, I mean, um, why, why, why does touching a dead body make you unclean? Because the dead body represents death. On the other hand, God is the author of life. So when you touch the dead body, it's as though you are associating with death rather than associating with God. Who is the god of life uh, so in that symbolic sense you um, you would need to undergo a ceremonial cleansing so that you you move away from death towards life so there's a deeper symbolism the deeper symbolism i mean if you were to bring it into new testament times would be that death destroys death corrupts on the other hand jesus gives life so Anything to do with death has to do with destruction and decay and loss. Everything that has to do with Jesus has to do with life and redemption and restoration. So you would avoid certain things in the Old Testament times and you would move towards certain good things in the Old Testament times, symbolically showing that you are moving towards God and life and turning your back towards death and decay and corruption. So everything in the Old Testament had spiritual significance. Um, 
so this is what the teachers of the law taught they said you know um, um, in case there is fungus on your walls then this is the kind of ceremony you need to undertake to cleanse your home so they would teach all of these things and much emphasis was placed on that but the spiritual implications of it the people of that time did not really understand so now jesus comes along and uh, comes along and he says you know what all these things which you have been doing there's a deeper meaning to it simply you know undergoing the ceremony and cleaning the walls uh, of the fungus uh, is not enough yes your house will now become you know healthier at a human level but that death and destruction which that fungus was representing that is still there inside your hearts that internal fungus has not yet been taken care of that has to be dealt with so jesus is now saying go beyond externals because the internal needs to be restored and that can happen only if you are birthed in the spirit only if you are born of water in the spirit and so you would need to believe in jesus only then will that happen so now the emphasis is on this so this is probably a jew who has been listening to jesus and has now come to believe in what jesus says so he goes to the disciples of john and says to them you know you keep you go on teaching about uh, ceremonial washing and all of that that is not really very helpful you need something more uh, over here please note this certain jew he is not condemning the act of baptism he is not condemning that he's talking about ceremonial washing ceremonial washing is basically you know the the hand the hands and feet cleansing which you need to do the scrubbing of the walls in case there's fungus on your walls he's talking about all those ceremonial cleanings so the certain jew mentioned over here he is saying all these things are not enough you need to go beyond that and john's disciples are very very upset so they come come to john the baptist and they say you know first of all we lost many people because you went and told them the jesus is the lamb of god now they left us and now they have all gone following jesus first of all we lost many people now there are people coming over here and starting arguments with us they are saying jesus is saying this jesus is saying that and they want to believe what jesus is saying and they are no longer listening to our teachings if if this goes on we will no longer have any followers left you know that is the that is their hearts cry because so with such faithfulness they gave up so many things to become followers of uh, john the baptist and now they have basically been his leaders and now these leaders don't have any followers everyone is leaving and going off and they're following jesus and what is jesus what's john the baptist response to this very simply he says in verse 27 to this john replied a person can receive only what is given them from heaven basically you and i what have we been given we have been given the duty of pointing towards jesus that is our duty not to build up a great followership not to become rich and famous that is not what has been given to us there's only one thing which has been given to us from heaven and that is to point towards jesus let us do that and if we are pointing really nicely to him and pointing so well to him that they are following him instead of following us excellent it means that we are doing a really good job so um john rejoices that he has been really good at pointing people towards jesus he's been pointing towards jesus so efficiently that people are leaving him and going off to follow jesus so he's actually done his um responsibility most beautifully and um, this in a way applies to all of us today as well we all have been given this responsibility of pointing towards jesus in different ways some people point to jesus as apostles and pastors some people point towards jesus as just one friend witnessing to another friend about this jesus and what he has done for them and how that jesus can help even the other person it, it's something very simple very informal so different people have been given this responsibility of pointing towards jesus in different ways not everyone is given the same uh, uh, responsibilities and the same giftings all you need to do is whatever you have been given from heaven please sincerely follow that 
and fulfill it. So if you're just doing faithfully whatever you has been assigned to you from heaven, that is more than enough. Um, but sometimes we tend to be like John's disciples. We want to be the apostle because the apostle is famous. His face comes on YouTube. Your face never comes on YouTube unless you put you know, some video of yourself over there. So which is why you know, sometimes we become like this John's disciples. We want the glory. We want the fame. But over here, John says, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. Be content with whatever you have been assigned from heaven. Um, so there are so many important, valuable giftings and responsibilities which are undervalued by the church today. And that should not be the case. Um, the ministry of hospitality. I mean, there are people who so beautifully open up their homes, you know, for people to come over there and have their cell group, for people to come and just sit and talk and express their, you know, their pain and their sorrow. There are people who open up their homes uh, so that um, if someone is in a deep need, they can come over there and they know they will find help you know, some kind of maybe a little bit of financial help or whatever. There are these people who have this beautiful gifting of ministry of hospitality. But they don't really move in it because they are looking at the stage and thinking, oh, those are the important people. Those are the ones who are achieving something great for God's kingdom. But if you look at the epistles, in most of the epistles, who, whom is Paul praising? You know, he, he sends greetings to you, you know, in your house, the church is meeting, the house church is meeting in your house. So by name, he mentions each member and he says, greetings to all of you. Because those guys are fulfilling a great ministry. I mean, imagine that the early church could not even have existed if nobody had opened their homes and, you know, expressed hospitality. Such an important ministry. Um, the ministry of the encourager. There are such few encouragers. People like Barnabas, you know, who took someone who was who was fallen and encouraged him and brought him back into the faith to a position where Paul praises John Mark and says, this man is really useful to me in my ministry. But who encouraged that John Mark? It was Barnabas, the encourager, who made that happen. So the ministry of encouraging, what a valuable, important ministry that is. Um, the ministry of administration. I mean, everybody thinks that the pastor is a very wonderful person, but the people behind the scenes, the staff members, you know, who do the logistics and the admin, nobody understands that how important they are. But they do have a vital role to play. So whatever has been given to us from heaven, if we can receive it and, and boldly with all enthusiasm, if we can fulfill that, then we are playing a vital role in the kingdom. Whether the world realizes it or not, God who's watching will reward us greatly because we are playing a vital part in this ministry of his. Okay, so um, so that is why, you know, I mean, this, this is the concept which John the Baptist is explaining to his disciples. So he says, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. So um, the... The friend of the bridegroom over here is, let us say, a kind of ancient version of the best man. I mean, you know, in our modern weddings, we have somebody who is appointed as the best man. So he's supposed to help the bridegroom. Um, he's supposed to even help out with logistics, you know, things like that. Uh, especially back then, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Israelite times, most of the arrangements for the wedding would be done by the uh, best man. So he would take care of a lot of details. In fact, uh, the bridal party, you know, the bride and all, and all her family members, they would need to travel a long distance to come over here for the um, uh, wedding ceremony. So it's basically this best man who would in fact go over there, bring them along, 
and bring them to this particular place you know where the wedding is going to take place so a lot of responsibilities um rested on the shoulders of the friend of the bridegroom and after having put in all of that effort you know he doesn't stand in a corner and sulk when the bride very happily smiles at the bridegroom she doesn't smile at the best man best man is somebody in the in the background her entire focus is on the bridegroom and she's all smiles and she's very happy to see him and she greets him but this best man who's standing in the corner doesn't sulk and say ah see all the compliments everything is going to the bridegroom he doesn't think that because his duty was to make all the arrangements for the bridegroom so that the bridegroom can have his royal day the entire focus is on the bridegroom not on the best man and john the baptist has understood that so he says it doesn't matter how much hard work i have had to put in it was all in preparation so that the bridegroom can have his day and the bridegroom has now arrived jesus has now arrived on the scene and i have made all the preparations now he is going to start wooing his bride and to bring her into the kingdom and i'm glad to see this happening so he says this this joy of seeing all of this happen is now mine and my joy is complete because my part i have done it efficiently now the messiah can take over and he can start wooing the bride and start bringing her to himself so he is satisfied and content that jesus is going to become greater and he is going to become less so he is so aware that all these people who had been his followers and his disciples all these days you know all the disciples and followers of john the baptist he is so aware that they are not his people they are jesus people so a day is going to he always knew a day is going to come when all this large number of followers is going to tell them to leave him and go to jesus and is quite happy with that idea with that whole uh, concept because you know if you remember it says in the gospels people were coming from distant cities just to come to him and get baptized at his hands he was that famous that important but he understood that all of these people who are coming to him they are not his they belong to the bridegroom they are going to become the future bride of the bridegroom so he never ever becomes possessive about them he only prepares them so that they can become better uh, so that they can become a better bride to the messiah so we should be having that attitude in our own ministry this is very important we must never think of the people who are there as our followers as our admirers no they are not over there to to get to admire you they are over there because god has placed you in a position of responsibility to prepare them so that they can be a better bride for the bridegroom you are just somebody who is the worker who is getting people ready to honor the bridegroom they are not there as your admirers as your followers you have a duty to perform so that should be our attitude where it's always jesus who is glorified and not us it also means that we would have to allow jesus to take decisions for these people yes to an to an extent the leader advises the leader sets an example uh, the leader says let us do things in this in this way this way this way but the people ultimately are answerable to the bridegroom to the messiah so um no leader can be very over controlling and say i am the leader you better listen to what i am saying and do things in my way no they have the freedom to go to their lord and master jesus christ because he is their lord and master and they are they have a right to to kneel down in his presence and take decisions according to the lord's guidance and will they don't always have to line up with what the church leader is saying because the church leader is not their ultimate master it's jesus who is their ultimate master so in fact um john brings out that point in the next thing which he says uh, maybe if we if we could have someone read out for us verses 31 to 34 yeah 
John 3, 31 to 34. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and he speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and hear that he testifies and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent to speak speaks the words of God, for God does not give the spirit by measure. Yeah. Um, so here we see that this Jesus is far superior to human leaders and human teachers. Human leaders and human teachers are from the earth. They belong to the earth and they speak as one from the earth. So there are limitations. Uh, every leader um, has his limitations because he is from the earth and he speaks as one from the earth. But Jesus is above all. And when he speaks, he speaks as, a, as someone who has the spirit without limit. Jesus was given um, the Holy Spirit without any limitations. So when he opened his mouth, he literally spoke what God the Father wanted spoken. So John the Baptist is saying over here, see, whatever I have taught these people so far, I have taught it to somebody who belongs to the earth. But now they, they need to start hearing from the Messiah himself because the Messiah contains the Holy Spirit without any limitations whatsoever. So he will be able to direct the people in the best way. So let them go after Jesus. Let them follow Jesus. Let them hear from him directly. And we should, we should prepare people and equip people to hear God in the same way. Because new believers are so dependent on the, on the person who brought them to the Lord. You know? So that person becomes like a mentor to that to, to the new believer. And the new believer, every time they have a problem, every time they have a question, they come running to you and they say, What do I do? What should I how what decision should I take? Please don't become their God. Give helpful, godly advice, but tell them, Have you prayed about this? What is the Lord saying to you from his scriptures? So, and teach them how to hear from God. So that is so important. John the Baptist understood that. He understood that he is from the earth and he can only speak as someone from the earth. But if he can train people to directly go to Jesus and hear from him, those people will be blessed much more because what comes out of Jesus' mouth is from the Spirit who is given without measure. So in the just like John the Baptist, we should train people to directly be able to go to Jesus and take their advice and guidance from him. From We can stand on the sidelines and be a godly advisor and supporter, but the ultimate decision making has to be between that person and God himself. That would be a, you know, a, a healthy way of um, doing things. And um, uh, so then after having said that, in verse 36, uh, this is what Jesus says. Um, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. The people who came to become followers of John the Baptist, it's a good thing which they did. Uh, they underwent the waters of baptism and they confessed their sins. They repented of their sins. So this was a good thing to do. But simply by repenting of their sins and undergoing that water baptism, they did not get eternal life. Something more was required. They needed to place their belief in the Messiah. Only then the eternal life would be given to them. So yes, it was a good thing which they did when they came and became followers of John the Baptist. But something more is required uh, because the people who just simply underwent only the water baptism which John the Baptist was offering, 
God's wrath was still remaining upon them. God's wrath was still resting upon them. That wrath of God got lifted away only when those people made a commitment to the Lord Jesus. So, which is why we we you know we have to understand the importance of that even today in our current setting. It is good. Water baptism is a good thing. But that water baptism is talking about spiritual things, about what Jesus Christ has done for us. It's talking about how we are entering into the waters along with him. We are, we are being crucified along with him. And then we are rising up out of the waters to a, to a victorious new way of life. So the water baptism is in fact talking about great spiritual truths. So simply doing it as an outward ritual alone cannot help. If someone is doing the water baptism simply as an outward ritual, then the wrath of God is still remaining and resting upon their heads. That is going to be removed and lifted off only when that person makes a personal commitment to the Lord Jesus. You know, so, um, so a human leader can never give those eternal aspects to a person. They can only direct and point that person towards Jesus. And Jesus is the one who gives us those eternal uh, things which we require for our uh, life. Uh, so in your notes, it says this about the uh, about John chapter 3. Um, I, in fact, I'll just simply read out that portion. It says, we might say that John 3 is a must-read chapter of the Bible because there are four important musts. In the in John chapter 3. The first must is John 3 7, uh, where it says, You must be born from above. It's a must. The second must is John 3 14, where it says, The Son of Man must be lifted up. The Son of Man had not been lifted up and become a curse for us, we all would have no hope. The curse would still be resting upon our heads. So it, it was a must that the Son of Man should be lifted up. The third must uh, it's, it, it refers to in your notes is John 3.30, where it says, He must increase, we must decrease. We must be those faithful best man, best men who are in the background, pointing people towards Jesus and feeling happy when they ignore us and praise Jesus. Because the import, the focus is not us, the focus is him. So he must increase. And the fourth must, which is there in uh, uh, John chapter 3, is um, John 3.30, which is, of course, I must decrease. Okay, so these are the things. So now that we have a little time, maybe we can actually get into chapter 4. You should never, ever waste time. Um, so yes, um, if maybe we can, uh, you know, um, read out verses one, two, six. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. If someone can read out John chapter four, uh, verses one to six. Uh, yeah, one to six. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had uh, learned that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called of Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being one weird from his journey, sat thus by the well it was about the sixth hour yes let's look at some of the you know significant things which uh, which uh, can be brought out from these verses um so right now the pharisees are beginning to realize how popular jesus is becoming um earlier it was john the baptist who had the maximum number of followers but now the number of followers following jesus is increasing day by day Jesus' disciples are baptizing many more people now rather than John the Baptist, uh, you know, used to. I mean, more than more what John the Baptist used to. So um, now the pressure is now beginning to increase slightly. Okay, so the Pharisees are not happy 
they are becoming anti jesus they are not very happy with jesus anymore because of his increasing popularity under these circumstances you know jesus is led by the holy spirit to move in a different direction to go to a different place and it says so there in verse 4 he had to go through samaria so uh he he he's, he he wants to go back to his you know home region which is galilee and it says he had to go through samaria a lot of uh, jewish people who considered themselves very very holy even though they have to you know their home is in galilee and they have to go back to galilee they will not go through samaria they will take a roundabout route to avoid samaria and to show off to the whole world how holy they are because the samaritans are supposed to be very very uh, spiritually bad low people and so just to prove how holy they are they'll in fact avoid even entering into the samaritan region and they'll take a roundabout route and go to galilee on the other hand the holy spirit is stirring him to go right directly through samaria and that is the reason he had to go through samaria because god the almighty god had one person in his mind and one one forgotten unimportant samaritan city in his mind so for the sake of that one woman and for those people who are considered so unimportant by the jewish people the holy spirit urges him to go directly through the samaritan region rather than avoiding it and taking the other route uh, and so jesus is now going through that samaritan region and he is now come near a city called saishar and that is in fact one of the more important cities of the samaritans because that is basically where you have the uh, plot of ground which jacob had given to his son joseph and a well had been established over there i uh, so you know that well had a lot of uh, historical significance for the people of that region uh, because you know this was literally the well which jacob had given uh, to his son and um, so at this particular place jesus is very very tired and he sits down to rest and his uh, disciples go off into the city to buy food okay so he is resting over here outside uh but the, the disciples have gone to per- make the purchases so they have gone obviously into the city so this is all something which um the basic god fearing jews the ones who call themselves god fearing they will not even go into these cities they will not even interact with the samaritan people they will not rub shoulders with them jesus disciples on the other hand don't care about all that jesus told them go is they happily going okay so they don't mind doing that so um at this point maybe we would have to uh, look a little bit into the background of the samaritans to understand the whole context most of us of course are already familiar with this but then for those of us who are not that familiar with this whole samaritan background um this goes back this uh, the story goes back to the time of the uh, exile when god's anger came upon the israelites Uh, and upon the tribes of juda and benjamin and he sends them into slavery all the way to babylon earlier a few hundreds uh, years before that uh, the judgment had already come upon northern israel those people had uh, been attacked by the assyrians who took them away as slaves so that had already happened and then god gave a second chance to these southern israel people to you know change their ways but then they also don't change their ways and so finally babylonians come and even they are taken away into exile to uh, babylon so at that time this entire land became very very empty this whole land of israel is now very very empty and uh, nobody is cultivating the ground there are no people living over there so the whole place is becoming kind of a wilderness kind of like a jungle and so at that time the babylonian ruler he takes people from other regions and puts them over here in this land of israel so that you know the land gets maintained crops are grown some income comes out from there which will benefit the babylonian king so with all those intentions he puts people over here and also the babylonians of that time they had this policy their international policy was this take people from one region dump them somewhere else pick up the people from the other region and dump them somewhere else the idea is that they'll all forget who they are they'll forget their 
identity and they'll all start thinking thinking of themselves as babylonians so that there will be unity that was their international policy so that was basically why they would pluck up people from one area and put them somewhere far away in another place hoping that they'll become intermingled with the people of that area and start thinking of themselves as one group of people so that was the intention so when these outsiders came and settled down in the land of israel the lord god began to bring judgment upon them wild lions began to attack the people many of them began to die and they got very very scared they said we have been sent by the king to live over here in this place and now lions are attacking us we are dying what to do who are the gods of this place we better start you know of making offerings to the gods of this place so that the gods will will stop being angry with us and stop sending lions to kill us so they enquire and then um they so then the babylonian king sends a priest or a teacher i don't particularly remember he sends somebody who knows who know who's, who's a jew who's a, who's an israelite he sends him to train the people of who are currently living over here to train them in the ways of yahweh to tell them about what yahweh believes and what he expects and how he must be honored and uh, you know obeyed so this person comes israelite person comes over here and starts teaching the people about the ways of yahweh and many of them out of the fear of the lions and the attacks start adopting this new religion that they have been introduced to so what do they do they mix up their own old religious beliefs with these new beliefs and they come up with one new kind of um, uh, masala so it's not the pure faith which yahweh expects nor is it their the old religion which they used to have earlier it's now a mixture it's it's a messed up mixture and that people of this entire region began to be called samaritans because they were in the region of samaria but as you know as we have noted down just now the samaritans are not proper followers of yahweh yes they have taken the first five books of moses yes they are aware of what is taught in those first five books but gradually as the years go by they start change making many many changes in the first five books so finally ultimately the samaritan pentateuch looks very different from the hebrew pentateuch but the word pentateuch basically means the first five books so the samaritan first five books start looking very different from the actual five books which the living god gave to moses so finally in the end when the israelite people come back to the land you know after they have been liberated by the persian king and they have been given permission to return back to their homeland at that time when the people come back they find that the land has been occupied by all these outsiders they call them samaritans um Oh, okay i just suddenly noticed nina's question which i had not seen and i got diverted uh, yeah um so yeah what was i saying yeah they come back over here to this uh, land and um um okay my train of thought yeah so this so this now they they have, they find a whole bunch of people living over here who are not in line with the original instructions and teachings of yahweh so they and if you if you remember in the books of um, ezra and nehemiah um, the local leaders they immediately come to the to to the to the returnees and they say to them we will help you you know we'll join along with you in rebuilding the temple so they want to make partnership with them but at that time very plainly uh, the leaders uh, who have returned they say to they say to them we don't want to have any part with you because you people are all corrupted we want to maintain the holy pure faith which we were given by yahweh so they don't mingle with the locals and from that point on there's an enmity which develops between the samaritans and the israelites because the israelites recognize that these samaritans are not of the pure faith 
they have gone far away from the truth so they choose not to intermingle with the samaritans they look down upon the samaritans uh, and in the same way the samaritans hate the israelites because the israelites consider them, themselves as superior but well, the sad fact is that as the years go by the israelites also become so corrupted that outwardly they are thinking themselves as children of god but in on the inside they are probably as sinful as the samaritan people so that's the state of affairs which is why now when you come to jesus times there's so much animosity between these two communities but jesus has come as the savior of the world whoever believes in him doesn't matter whether you're a jew or whether you're a samaritan he has come for anyone who is willing to believe in him so which is why now jesus is making an effort to reach out to these samaritan communities okay so that is the uh, background um we have just 4 minutes left and uh, nina has put up this question here um is it better not to use only begotten son or have an explanation for it um it's just that uh, the niv team and many of the other teams do not believe that that's the correct word so they will not use the word begotten because they really be honestly sincerely believe that monogene that word monogene is not derived from the root word genao which means give to give birth to they really genuinely grammatically believe that monogene is derived from genos which is talking about of a specific kind of a specific category so because they grammatically believe that they are correct in the way they have interpret they are interpreting the biblical greek they choose to use the word one and only um so it's not just to maybe please the muslims or to be to give an explanation to the muslims that they have chosen to come up with this translation they really genuinely believe grammatically that they are correct that the word monogene is derived from genos which means of a specific kind one and only type they do not believe that monogene is derived from genao which has got two ends because monogene has got only one n and uh, so for the sake of grammar gra grammatical accuracy many of the versions will go with um one and only which is referring to one particular category one particular type or class so they will not go with the word uh, genao which is you know giving birth to so yes uh, this translation was not done just to maybe appease the muslim community this translation has been done based on the uh on what they believe is the correct grammar to be used i hope that helps if not you still have 2 minutes for a follow up question <laughs> yeah uh can you hear me are you able to hear me i am able to hear you go ahead yes yeah no so i mean since it's used uh, so i mean in so many translations and we've kind of got used to that thing uh, only begotten son so uh, does that mean only uh, like birthing or you know so i'm i'm just taking the explanation from one of the creeds what their mainline churches use no hmm. where they say it is uh, god of god a begotten but not made the it's being of one substance with the father so i mean yeah I, it, i think it will be very useful definitely to speak to muslims that that is not the meaning uh but uh, begotten does it mean only like birthing or does it have any other meaning just asking i'm just inquiring please oh, yeah yeah yes i know um so uh, monogene is definitely from uh, i mean i mean if, you, if you're saying that the root word is genao genao would definitely be talking about giving birth to um oh, uh -huh. there is a sense of uh, of uh -huh. a beginning anything that is given birth to has got a beginning it has not been there always so it kind of uh, oh, okay. eats away at the infinity in, infinite divine nature of jesus, of jesus. so that oh. so this so there's that slight um, 
uh, theological complication which can come in is anything that is uh -huh. given birth to has a beginning but in the beginning was the word of god and the word was, was with god and the word was god there was no beginning for him yeah. he was always yeah. there so in that sense that jenao uh -huh. can create problems um, so uh -huh. yeah okay yeah. all right yeah all right thank you so yes we it our time is up so if we can close with a word of prayer please lord we just thank you so much for the learnings that we could pick up from john chapter 3 today uh, we pray oh lord that we would be people who do not love the darkness but who love the truth and are willing to come into the light of the truth receive correction and be willing to repent of our sins so that we can live in a way that glorifies and honors Jesus, which promotes him rather than promoting ourselves. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would enable us to live in that manner. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.